Good evening. I hope you're somewhere comfortable, because the following events are true and really scary. Mom, please take the vacuum to another room. It all started on October 7th. I was invited to a friend group sleepover at my friend Marla's house. I'm not usually invited to sleepovers, but this was a special occasion. We were continuing our Halloween movie marathon of Ginger Dead Man vs. Evil Bong. Real movie, look it up. Anyways, I arrived at the house first. As I parked my car, I realized that I was the only guy that would be sleeping over. I had three other people spending the night at the party with me. There was Marla, the host, Katie, and Sally. I walked into Marla's house and she greeted me. This was when things got spooky. After several minutes of talking, we ran out of topics to talk about. Dread consumed me. I could see Marla's face turn sheet white. We had absolutely nothing to talk about. Abject terror consumed my insides. My life flashed before my eyes. This was the end. Suddenly, Marla's father stumbled into the room. We both screamed. Dad, get out of the kitchen! Marla shrieked. Hey, kiddo! Marla's father chortled. I was just moseying into the kitchen to grab myself a snack. The only snack you'll be grabbing is sewage from our septic tank in the basement if you don't get out of the kitchen! Marla screamed. Marla's dad chuckled and looked at me. Oh, that Marla has such a silly way with words. Marla clutched an unopened glass bottle of wine and chucked it at her father's face, nearly shattering his skull as glass flung everywhere around the kitchen. Marla's father chuckled again. So, sweetie, are you going to introduce me to your friend? This is Joe. He's going to spend the night because we're having a movie marathon. Marla replied. Marla's father stopped chuckling. A shadow fell over his now stern face. The energy shifted, and a cold shiver danced up and down my spine. Marla, Marla's father spoke. I told you, no boys at the sleepover. I turned to face Marla. She looked meek and scared. He doesn't even... She began. Marla's father ran towards Marla and grabbed her by the arms. Marla, listen to me. He goes home tonight. You and the rest of the girls can still have your sleepover, but not with him. Okay, Dad. Marla muttered as she looked at the ground. Later into the night, after everyone arrived at the party... We sat around, ready to watch Ginger Dead Man vs. Evil Bong. All the lights were off and several candles were lit, dimly lighting the small area surrounded by the encompassing darkness of the room. It's okay, Joe. You can still sleep over. Just don't let my parents see you, Marla said. Hey guys, I don't really want to watch this. It looks scary, Sally said. Your mom looks scary, Marla snapped. My mom disappeared five years ago, Sally replied. Oh, sorry, Marla said apologetically. Your mom looked scary. Katie chimed in. I know you guys are hungry, so I made us all some pumpkin bread with a side of mystery soup. Marla swiveled her head like a robot and faced Katie. Oh, my God, I am starving. Katie unwrapped a tinfoil bin, holding the food. The girls pounced on the pumpkin bread, tearing it to pieces like seagulls in an oyster restaurant. All that was left for me was the mystery soup. I reluctantly grabbed a plastic spoon and dipped it into the bowl. I turned to Katie. Is this soup safe to eat? I asked. I don't think I had to go to the ER after the taste test, Katie replied. I was hungry, so I took a sip. A horrific mistake. This was when things got spooky. Instantly, my stomach let out a vile gurgle. I clutched my abdomen as a sharp pain harshly rang the bell of my organs. Where's the bathroom? I asked, 
desperate to rid my body of this horrible substance. Marla began to give directions. So you go down the hall, to the right, then take another right, then go up the first set of stairs you see, take another left, then a right, then a left, then another left, then a right, then go up to go down, control sprint, crouch, then take a final right, and the door should be on your northwest region. Thank you, Marla, I said, sprinting to the bathroom. I burst through the bathroom door. Marla was rich and had one of those fancy tech toilets. I screamed in agony, clutching my stomach. I typed in a command on the toilet's keypad. Please state the nature of this restroom visit, a robot voice said. Bathroom, I said, gasping for air. I selected an option for a morphine injection on the keypad, but an error screen showed up. Error, morphine dispenser malfunction, the robot voice stated. I screamed in frustration. The pod door opened and I shakily hoisted myself onto the machine and closed the pod door. Please select method of waste expulsion, the robot voice said. Poop! I shouted, clutching my stomach as I writhed in pain. The agonizing procedure began and I screamed again, convulsing from pain. I should have been drinking more water. After finishing using the restroom, I wiped the three inch thick layer of sweat off my forehead. I breathed a sigh of relief and attempted to flush the toilet. It did not flush. This was when things got spooky. Terror and panic filled my soul as I frantically jiggled the handle. The toilet remained unflushed. In a last ditch effort to hide my waste, my eyes spotted an empty grocery bag in the trash can. I looked up at the ceiling and begged God for mercy as I reached into the toilet with the bag and collected my own feces. I closed the bag and silently rushed out of the room. I ran back to the room where we all were and hid the bag behind my back after spotting Marla. I couldn't tell her what happened. The thought terrified me. Oh my God, Joe, where have you been? Sally's dead! Marla screamed. I looked up and saw Sally plastered on the ceiling. She was held up by three pool cues, stabbed through her body and into the ceiling. Her face was twisted into a horrific expression. Blood trickled down from her fatal wounds onto the carpet below. Although this was really scary, I had an even more terrifying situation that I had to deal with. I looked back at Marla and asked her if she had a dumpster or a large garbage can. Marla replied, Oh yeah, so you're gonna go to the right, then up the stairs, take another right, then a left, then a right, then clap your hands, clap, 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 clap your hands, crisscross, to the left, take it back, one hop, take another right, then you'll reach the outside garbage bin. Thank you, Marla, I said, as I ran out of the room, following her directions. I arrived in the kitchen. It was cold and quiet. Aware it was far past midnight, I tiptoed as quietly as I could. Every creak of the floorboard sent shivers down my spine, fearing that a relative of Marla would discover me. I quietly tried the doorknob of the kitchen door that led outside. It was locked. Horror encompassed my heart as I glanced at the alarm box. The alarm had been set, meaning that there was no way I could dispose of this waste in the outside trash bin. The gears in my head turned. I felt trapped, like Bill Murray in Garfield 2004. I swung around the room, searching for a way to get rid of the bag I was holding. Something wet hit my foot. Slowly but surely, I glanced down. My jaw dropped in a state of absolute terror. The bag was leaking. This was when things got spooky. My brain cartwheeled, frantically thinking of ways to stop the leak. The refrigerator caught my eye. Eureka, I thought. I could freeze the bag and its contents, stopping the leak in order to give me more time to figure out how to dispose of the bag. I managed to open the refrigerator door. There, lying front and center, was Katie's decapitated head. I didn't have time to be scared. I had to figure out how to get rid of this bag. I placed the bag into the freezer alongside Katie's head and I shut the door. I wiped my hands on my pants and turned around. Suddenly, a large shirtless man in a goose mask swung an axe towards me. I jumped to the side and the axe hit the refrigerator, knocking it to its side. 
There were blood stains all over the man. I was pretty sure that the blood did not belong to him. I screamed, scared that the bag burst in the freezer, contaminating Marla's food. I ducked down as the man swung the axe again, missing my head, and I pried open the refrigerator door. To my relief, the bag had not burst. I pushed Katie's deceased head out of the way, and I grabbed the bag. I turned away just as the man swung the axe down onto the freezer, cutting it in half. I ran into the living room, desperately searching for a place to hide the bag. Fear struck me like lightning as I wondered if the man saw the bag full of poop that I was holding. I couldn't bear to think about it. It was too embarrassing. The room was dark, so I searched for a light switch. After finding one on the other side of the room, I turned it on. There, in the center of the room, was Marla. She was being held up on a giant wooden cross in the state of being crucified. Marla's hands twitched with the pain from the nails that were pierced through them into the wood. She picked her head up and looked at me. Help me, she whispered. My nerves danced, and I hid the bag behind my back, hoping that she did not see it. I began to speak, but was interrupted when the man slammed the door open and barged into the living room with his axe. I felt awkward. I didn't know what else to do, but continued to hide the bag behind my back. Dad, please stop! Marla screamed. The man removed his goose mask, revealing himself to be Marla's father. Sweetie, what did I say about having boys over to spend the night? Marla's father angrily spat. Marla twitched on her cross and gagged. But dad, he doesn't even like girls! She screamed. That's no excuse, Marla's dad replied. You do not invite boys to girls' sleepovers, period. End of story. I stood there awkwardly. I hated getting into family arguments, especially if they were about me. I was pretty uncomfortable, and the fact that I had a bag of my own fecal matter in my hands did not help. After finishing arguing with Marla, her father turned to look at me. You, he said, anger in his voice. I'm going to tear your intestines out and hang them like Christmas ornaments. I cringed. This was so embarrassing. He stepped towards me with the axe, slowly raising it over his head. Suddenly, he stopped and looked at where my hands were. What are you hiding behind your back? He asked. This was when things got spooky. I gulped. For the first time that night, I was truly terrified. Nothing, I said, looking at the floor. Well, if it's nothing, then why don't you show me your hands? Show me! Marla's father yelled. I panicked, screaming from fear. I swung the bag and chucked it at Marla's father. The bag hit his face and exploded. The contents of the bag flew everywhere. Marla's father, hunched over, violently puked and passed out. Screaming, I grabbed his axe and broke the window. I ran out of the house, cutting myself in the process. I didn't care. I just needed to escape. I try to forget what happened. But to this day, I am reminded of the horrors that took place at Marla's house. I was too embarrassed to tell anyone, let alone the police. From that day on, I never attended another sleepover. Bye.